episode of Off The Script, number 171, part number one, for your Saturday, May 27th, 2017! I got news! I'm the Maharaja, Jinder Mahal. You all wanted my opinion on Jinder Mahal. I'm going to give it to you. Plus everything that's been talked about since he won the WWE Championship at Backlash. Also, why WWE isn't getting involved in the Broken Gimmick Saga. News on something that might put Matt Hardy a few steps back, and getting the rights to the broken gimmick. Also, plans for Sasha Banks at Extreme Rules. Long-term plans for the WWE Universal Championship and one Brock Lesnar. Reason why Paul Heyman confronted Finn Balor on Monday Night Raw. Plans for a SmackDown Women's Division Money in the Bank ladder match at Money in the Bank. Also, Rumors on a steel cage match happening at Extreme Rules for the WWE Raw Tag Team Championships. Why is steel cage? And what is the idea behind all of that? Plus, all that and a pro wrestling crate unboxing right here on the return of the number one fucking podcast right here on YouTube.com. This is off the script. JD from New York, 206. It's hyper off the script. Big show and Ryback, Strowman and Roman. Get off my fucking TV. Save me the misery. And all you fucking goons, just grab a cold beer. The man of the hour is finally here. JD from New York, 206. It's time for off the script. JD from New York, 206. It's time for off the What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. Thank you so much for tuning back into the channel on this May 27th, 2017. This is, of course, the number one fucking podcast, not only on YouTube.com, but in each and every one of your subscription boxes. This is Off The Script. Thank you so much for still... Even through this week, your continued love and support, man. Thank you all for sticking with me. I'm not dead. I'm not quitting. I'm not going anywhere. We have a whole world to conquer, and I'm going nowhere. I know that might make the fucking haters and the detractors a little bit salty, but uh, look at the face. Do I give two shits about what you fucking think? Of course not, motherfucker! I'm back, and I ain't going anywhere! So this is here to stay, bar none! This podcast is going nowhere, man. I'm in some fucking mood, and you guys are gonna get one hell of a scathing podcast, as you can always expect, right here on Off The Script, man. We got a lot to get into. Um, 11 a.m., you guys are watching this video. I, as this video goes live, will be preparing myself to call Anthony Gangone versus the American Nightmare Cody Rhodes tonight at the NYC Arena House of Glory Championship on the line. Rhodes Gangone in the main event as House of Glory presents Adrenaline. If you guys are going to be in Queens, or in the resounding New York City area, I urge you not to miss this show. Uh, not only because of that, but because 
of something that I'm probably looking forward to more than Cody Rhodes versus Anthony Gangone. Leo Rush. Leo Rush and his return match from last year against our crown jewel champion, Ken Cashflow Broadway. And what a match that those two had. And they are getting a rematch. Or Leo Rush is getting a rematch once again for the crown jewel championship tonight at Adrenaline, man. I can't fucking wait to call that one. That was probably the best House of Glory match all 2016, so it's going to be one hell of a show, plus the Impact Tag Team Champions. You got EYFBO are going to be there as well. Uh, they are the Impact and House of Glory Tag Team Champions. They will be defending the Tag Team Championships against, get this, Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish. It's going to be fucking awesome, man. I can't wait to see you guys out there if you are indeed going. House of Glory, HOGWrestling.net. Please go and subscribe to their YouTube channel. Follow them all over social media. They have a live show each and every Friday on Facebook, which I am a huge part of doing commentary and voiceovers for. So make sure you guys go, make sure you guys go and check that out, man. House of Glory, the next biggest promotion that uh, you will be hearing from in the world of independent wrestling, man. I will be there tonight, so come and say what's up. If you guys want to buy me a beer, I will not be opposed to that. I work better under Guinness. So uh, I'll see you guys there at the NYC Arena uh, in Queens, New York, man. I want to get right into everything, man. I'm not even going to fucking talk about taking the week away. It's bullshit. It is what it is. I am going to talk strictly wrestling, okay? So we'll get into that. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank my patrons for being with me, even uh, through all the uh, canceled pledges. Uh, I'm not dead. I am not going anywhere. I didn't quit the channel. I'm not stealing your money and running away. I'm not doing any of those things that were proposed. Okay? I needed to be away. I could not give you the JD that you guys wanted uh, under certain circumstances, and I, I I didn't want to be unfair to you guys. You guys come here for a specific sounding and looking and uh, theatric JD. Uh, I was none of those things, but uh, hopefully we can uh, start anew here on episode 171 right here on YouTube.com. Also available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Audioboom, and Google Play Music. Soon to be coming to the IRW Network. I got my notes ready, motherfucker. We're ready to review the 1992 Royal Rumble. So look forward to that June 1st. You're not going to want to miss JD doing off the script retro starting in 1992 with the Royal Rumble and Ric Flair's monumental Royal Rumble victory, man. I actually went back and watched that pay-per-view. I, I did not know how horrible the undercard was, man. I'm like, what the fuck? Seriously, that show was awful besides that Royal Rumble, but I mean, that, that whole thing, the whole Royal Rumble made the whole show, so I, I guess I can't really complain, but the undercard was awful. Very, very lackluster. Um, and, and when I got to see the Bushwhackers going up against the fucking Beverly Brothers in nothing but a fucking 20-minute comedy match, I'm like, fuck, please, kill me. Please. Holy shit. But uh, that's coming on IRW Network. You can sign up now for free. Up until June 1st, up uh, up on June 1st, you guys are going to have to subscribe if you guys want to hear Off the Script Retro, exclusive to the Eric Bischoff Network, IRWNetwork.com. Go and sign up for free now. June 1st, you got till June 1st, so make sure you guys take advantage of that right away. I will not be doing Patreon roll calls because of what I said. A lot of you guys uh, deleted pledges, which I hope to see you return because I thought those people thought I was dead for some reason or just going away, but uh, I will be back uh, each and every week going forward so you guys can resume your pledges if you so wish. Uh, if you guys want to support the show, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Everybody on Patreon is getting this video fucking early, so no questions about it, man. Patrons are getting off the script early, plus access to Discord, and the Q&As will resume next week as well. I will put a thread for you guys to ask questions for next week's Patreon-exclusive Q&A. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Thank you to everybody on there. Pledging, as always, we are 378 patrons strong. I love to reach 500 before SummerSlam, man. That's a goal for Patreon, so thank you guys so much for your generosity and your support of this very channel and this podcast. If you guys want to support in another way, Audible is always giving you guys the hookup, man. They are sticking with us through thick and thin, man. Audible, audibletrial.com. 
slash off the script. Make sure you guys go and check that out. They're still offering you guys one free audio book and their service free for 30 days. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. You guys can get AJ Lee's new book. You guys can pre-order Jim Ross's new book, Mick Foley's new book, The Death of WCW, Bob Holly, Daniel Bryan, Shawn Michaels, and so much more with that exclusive offer for listeners right here of Off The Script, audibletrial.com slash Off The Script. And if you guys end up canceling the service, you get to keep your audio book for free. Over 180,000 choices to choose from. Take advantage of that. It is an absolutely amazing way to support this show. Barbershopwindow.com slash Off The Script for your t-shirts. We are an official partner with Pro Wrestling Tees and Barber shop window, so make sure you guys get your t-shirts. Nine different designs, plus the JD is Negan and JD is Negan get off my TV hit list t-shirts available now. Hot sellers on Barber shop window, nineteen ninety nine. They ship worldwide, no matter where you are. Barber shop window dot com slash off the script, and we are still sponsored by Loot Crate. If you guys are interested in anything Loot Crate has to offer, try Loot dot com slash off the script. Make sure you guys go and check that out. As always, we are still partnered with Loot Crate. So thank you to them for sponsoring off the script. Uh, being that I ran through all of that, man, uh, we're not gonna do some sub we're not gonna do sub stories this week. I, I wanna reassess all the sub stories. We'll get back into that next week. Uh, I just wanna really hit the wrestling news uh, you know, on this on this Saturday for you guys. I wanna I don't wanna have any bullshit. All right, but I, I did receive a whole slew of boxes. I got Pro Wrestling Crate, I got uh, something from, from my, my buddy, a patron, uh, a loyal subscriber of mine, British Davis. He's got something we'll be unboxing as well on tomorrow's episode. And then we have Wrestle Crate. Uh, they sent me something as well, plus that wrestling club, man. So I got a bunch of shit to unbox for you guys. We're going to start with my favorite, though. I got I to gotta start with my favorite, man. ProWrestlingCrate.com. P.W. Crate, if you guys are interested in anything these guys have to offer, man, after you see what I unbox here, I'll give you guys exclusive links, I'll give you guys discount codes, it's my favorite box, and I don't mean that in any disparaging way to take anything away from those fine people over there, but Pro Wrestling Crate is my favorite box of the month because I just love what they do, man, and you always get the best bang for your buck with Pro Wrestling Crate, uh, Pro Wrestling Crate, ProWrestlingCrate.com. And if you guys like anything you see here, you go to the website, you sign up for whatever they're offering you, enter the coupon code off the script for, I believe, 20% off your first subscription, man. So make sure you guys take advantage of that. We're going to unbox this motherfucker right now, man. So let's see what we got in here. Let me see. Uh, this is Tag Teams. Uh, next month's crate is going to be extremely hardcore, but this month's crate is tag team, so everything you see in this, in this box, in this unboxing, is going to be tag teams. That's the spoiler card right there, tag teams. I don't want to read what's on the other side, because it's going to spoil what's in the crate. And like I said, next month is extremely hardcore. Uh, I like what I see already. Hopefully there's some hardies in here, you know, but look at this, man. Look at this. Walking Disaster. Axe and Smash. Demolition. Look at that, man. That's beautiful. That's beautiful right there. Demolition t-shirt. Look at that. And you guys know Pro Wrestling Tees. It's of the finest quality, man. This Tatanka t-shirt is from Pro Wrestling Crate. So you guys know that they're doing good shit, man. Pro Wrestling Crate. Make sure you guys go and check it out. I seriously, seriously want you guys to go do that. What do we got here, man? What do we got here? Since day one... The Briscoes. Look at that. The Briscoe Brothers. Very, very nice t-shirt there, man. Beautiful. Briscoe Brothers t-shirt. We got Demolition and the Briscoes. What is this? We got Rock and Roll Express. I believe this is the Rock and Roll Express here, man. 2017 Hall of Famers for WWE. Music City, USA. Look at that, man. The Rock and Roll Express. I love that with the dueling guitars there. Beautiful. ProWrestlingCrate.com. What do we got here, man? Oh, these guys are going to be right in front of me in the ring. Challenging for the House of Glory Tag Team Championships, man. Look at that. Red Dragon. Beautiful. Look at that. Nice, uh, nice uh, stress-release toy, man. Nice rubber. You know, if you get angry or if I get angry at fucking Monday Night Raw, I could squeeze this motherfucker and just release a whole bunch of stress. So that's pretty cool there. What do we got here? Uh... 
Business cards. Ooh, what is this? The Hardys DVD compilation. Pro Wrestling Crate exclusive high spots. Uh, this is featuring the Hardys versus the Lucha Brothers, Penta and Phoenix from WrestleCon 2017, which I didn't get to see. We got backstage with Broken Matt, Hardys versus the Young Bucks, New Wrestling Under the, Under the Stars 3, uh, Brother Nero, and then Jeff Hardy versus Sammy Callahan, TLC match, and that is PWX Rise of a Champion, 12, and then we got Omega, Uncommon Passion Clip, whatever the hell that means, it is what it is, man, uh, another pin, Legion of Doom, there you go, Legion of Doom, exclusive lapel pin, and... We got a photograph. Ooh. We got two autographs. Oh. They're not a tag team anymore, man. Poor Johnny Gargano, man. Poor Johnny Gargano. We got news on uh, Tommaso Ciampa today as well. Terrible fucking news uh, on his injury. He is going to be out a very, very long time. Don't know what the fuck's going on there. But we got Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, the psycho killer. And then we got uh, the natural disasters, man. Look at that. Typhoon and Earthquake. Typhoon signing that. Obviously, John Tenta, rest in peace. No longer with us. Natural disasters there, man. That's beautiful. You got to love Pro Wrestling Crate, man. You really got to love Pro Wrestling Crate. ProWrestlingCrate.com. Use the code off the script for 20% off your first crate, man. Thank you to them as always. I love their product. I am officially partnered with Pro Wrestling Tees and Barbershop Window. So I, I love this every single month, man. Tomorrow we'll do, um, I believe we'll do Wrestle Crate and then we'll do that wrestling club. And then we'll also unbox British Davis and his uh, surprise that he sent us. I don't know what he sent me, but uh, we'll unbox that as well tomorrow. So make sure you guys tune into Off the Script on Sunday morning. That is all I got, man. Hope you enjoyed the unboxing. ProWrestlingCrate.com. Now a word from the general himself, as always, to lead into this week's Off the Script. A word from Matt Hardy before we get into the plethora of news and rumors on this episode. Of off the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I have broken that heart. This is JD from New York. Actually, delete JD from New York. I have cleaned this vessel. Make sure to check out his wondering show off the script. It's absolutely delightful. Wow. All right, guys, we're going to start off with this one being that uh, we just seen a beautiful autograph from Pro Wrestling Crate on DIY. Uh, if you guys missed my NXT TakeOver Chicago review, it was literally the last video I did before I took my little hiatus. If you guys missed that, 30,000 views and still going. Thank you for all the support on that video. I really love the way that video came out. And the big thing, the takeaway from TakeOver Chicago was the ending. And that ladder match with the Authors of Pain and DIY and the uh, what, what people have been predicting the incoming heel turn on Johnny Gargano, courtesy of Tommaso Ciampa. Now, according to the report here, they, they claim that Tommaso Ciampa broke the hearts of wrestling fans at TakeOver Chicago. He didn't break my fucking heart. I, I gave you my reasons for why I didn't want to see DIY break up, but uh, if it's going to result in classics that I know Gargano and Ciampa can give us together, then I am all for it. I even have stated, and I made mention of this several times during the Cruiserweight Classic, a match that a lot of people overlooked in their top 10 for best match of 2016, Gargano and Ciampa during the Cruiserweight Classic. Go back and watch it. I said it as soon as that match was over. Both men have the makings of being each other's best rival. And I stick to that, and I have not strayed away whatsoever. So he didn't break my heart at NXT TakeOver Chicago. In fact, I thought it was beautifully done. And after losing the ladder match for the NXT Tag Team titles, Ciampa turned on Gargano. The fan favorite team, DIY, is no more. A few days later, prior to TakeOver, Tommaso Ciampa suffered an injury at an NXT Live event. Thankfully, Ciampa was able to still wrestle in the ladder match, and he took one hell of a fucking beating. 
We have some potential bad news for fans of Tommaso Ciampa and his status moving forward with WWE. According to Mike Johnson of PW Insider, Tommaso Ciampa suffered a separate injury during the ladder match. Now, Ciampa was at this week's NXT taping, but was seen using crutches. He's reportedly being sent to Birmingham, Alabama, which is never a good thing if he's going to Birmingham for surgery and rehab. Birmingham is where WWE sends the majority of their stars for surgery and or rehabilitation treatment. There will be more information available in the next few days. According to Triple H, he mentioned that the injury to Ciampa was, and I use this term, uh, and this is a term Triple H used, he used the term significant. Now, Ciampa apparently appeared at the NXT tapings to tell fans that he will be out for a while. This will probably air on NXT television in the coming weeks, but um, we were all set to watch Gargano and Ciampa probably go one-on-one -on -one at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. That is now going to be put on hold. So, what a shitty situation. You know, I understand they wanted to do the big payoff, but uh, we didn't think anything of this coming out of TakeOver. We thought, you know, he was injured, you know, with the leg and all that, and, you know, he, he, he got through that ladder match, hellacious as it was, and he looked fine. He looked fine in the post-match beatdown of, of Gargano, but uh, there is no information available on what is injuring him or, or what is ailing him. But Triple H used this term significant, which is never a good thing. We're just going to have to find, uh, you know, and wait. We're going to have to find information soon. Hopefully Meltzer or, or Mike Johnson does a, a, a separate story on this and, and fills us in, you know, very, very soon. Uh, we're going to have to wait to the tapings to see what it really is. No idea, man. This is very disheartening. Um, I was looking forward to this feud, to be, to be perfectly honest with you. I thought this is something that was going to set the NXT world on fire, man. I, I really, I really did. Uh, but this is a huge blow to NXT to lose Tommaso Ciampa after such a big injury angle or, or a big angle in itself took place at the end of TakeOver Chicago, man. I, I hope him uh, for a speedy recovery. I, I really do. And I hope this isn't as significant as Triple H is claiming it to be. But uh, if, he sent, if he's being sent to Birmingham, <laughs> I mean, it's not the death of your career, but uh, you go to Birmingham, you're going to be there for a very long time rehabilitating, man. So it's not a good thing that Ciampa is being sent to, uh, I believe, Dr. James Andrews for surgery and rehab. So it's just the luck of the draw, man. It comes with the territory. Tommaso Ciampa out. We don't know how long. We don't even know what's ailing him. But hopefully we will find out sooner rather than later the proposed feud with Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano is now on the back burner. We're going to move on here, man. Several, several rumors going around. Uh, backlash ticket sales on Sunday's pay-per-view and Jinder Mahal's push as WWE Champion. This has been something that a lot of people have wanted my opinion on. I did watch the pay-per-view. I watched it with my father, who seemed to enjoy it very, very much. Um, he was laughing at the Fashion Police, which I thought was fantastic in that tag team match with the Usos. Some people didn't like it. Some people didn't like the tag team championships being contested in what was to be a comedy match. But it got the Fashion Police, it got Fandango, and it got Tyler Breeze over. And I was really hoping they would at least pull out an upset on SmackDown this week and win the Tag Team Championships, but that was not the case. Uh, I don't know where they go from here. I I've been telling you guys that I, I don't see the WWE putting the titles on the Fashion Police, but I'm very, gr I'm very grateful and happy that they're at least getting an opportunity because I know these guys can get over. You know? I, I know they have it within them to get over. They are entertaining. And the WWE is letting them shine for at least a little bit. Hopefully that continues because I see a lot of upside in the fashion police. But uh, I'm not straying away from what WWE is doing. I knew with the Usos being the tag team champions, they were not going to lose the titles to the fashion police because you got the New Day looming and you know the WWE is going to want to book, especially for SmackDown, the big tag team title match for SummerSlam, New Day versus the Usos, babyface team versus heel team. You're not going to want to do the New Day versus the Fashion Police, even though I would like that preferably. I don't see the WWE going in that direction. So when the Fashion Police lost, I was not surprised one bit. But what I was surprised about 
was when Jinder Mahal pinned Randy Orton to be the WWE champion, to win the championship. Um, I didn't think WWE was going to go through with it on the first shot. I thought it, may, it might have happened, you know, at the next pay-per-view at least. But Randy Orton is getting his rematch. You know, there are rumors going around. I don't know where people are hearing this, that Jinder Mahal is going to hold the title to the Royal Rumble. I didn't hear anything like that. I didn't see anything like that. I didn't see anything being reported as such. You know, I heard as soon as September, he might be losing the title. I've even heard people pitching ideas that the anti-American now, Jinder Mahal, you know, people don't like the way he dresses. They don't like the way he looks. They don't like the way he talks and speaks. They don't like his background. Whatever the case may be, they're turning him into they're turning him into an anti-American entity on WWE television. So what does that mean? Everybody's automatically thinking, "Oh, here we go. John Cena's seventeenth title reign is looming. He's gonna take down the the uh, anti-American Jinder Mahal. God forbid." We didn't want to see Orton and Jinder. Now we're going to have to see Cena and Jinder? No. I'll pass, bro. Seriously, I'll pass. But I was I was shocked. I was shocked. I, 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 didn't, I didn't really, you know, emit emotion like you guys thought I did, even though I didn't do a review on it. I didn't come on here scathing. I didn't watch the, the pay-per-view in the closing segments and fucking start cursing up a storm in front of my parents when I watched it. No, I didn't do no such thing. I was like, wow, they actually went ahead and did what nobody thought they were going to do. They gave Jinder Mahal the WWE champion uh, ship. He is now the 50th WWE champion in company history. Do I approve of Jinder being the WWE champion? Yes, I do. Anybody is better than babyface Randy Orton. I don't give a fuck. How many accolades Randy Orton has or how big of a superstar Randy Orton is. Randy Orton is like watching fucking paint dry as WWE champion and being a babyface. Awful. Awful. That went nowhere. Randy Orton was interesting when he was with Bray Wyatt and you didn't know what the fuck he was doing. We all awaited him to turn on Bray Wyatt and then all of a sudden they sped that up. Ruin that fucking feud. They had a terrible match at WrestleMania, and then the rest was history. We have House of Horrors, and it was over before you know it. It's like, they built all that up, and they went to the climax, and it's like, okay, he turned on Bray Wyatt. This feud's now over. Instead of letting it linger and build a little bit more, they went right for the kill, you know? But babyface Randy Orton is absolutely god-awful. Heal Randy Orton. I could watch all that long, because that's what Randy Orton is to me. He's a quintessential heel. So with Jinder Mahal winning the WWE Championship, you know, I was like, okay, they pulled that one out of their fucking ass, but I wasn't here scathing. Backlash didn't kill me. I actually enjoyed Backlash. I thought Backlash was a very good pay-per-view for three hours. Very good pay-per-view. Much better than what the fuck WWE did at, uh, at Payback, you know? That's what I thought anyway. Payback wasn't that bad. Payback was underwhelming going in, but, you know, when they don't have no build going into a pay-per-view and everybody goes in there and wants to fucking wrestle their hearts out, it ends up being a good pay-per-view. But I enjoyed what Backlash did more than, than Payback did. And I thought Backlash was a very, very good pay-per-view. I love the Chicago crowd. I love Nakamura's debut. I love the entrance and the way Chicago showered love on Nakamura, but obviously NXT TakeOver Chicago was the highlight of the whole weekend. No question. That's not a surprise. But Jinder being the WWE Champion, listen, I don't mind, man. I don't mind. Now, do I believe in Jinder Mahal? Fuck no. I don't believe in Jinder Mahal. I still don't understand why WWE is getting so behind Jinder. You know, uh, 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 let me rephrase that. I, I do understand why, and, and from a business aspect, if they want to market in India, it does make sense. I'm not going against what WWE wants to do business-wise, because all they care about is making money. WWE doesn't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about me. They don't give a shit about their fans. They are going to do what's best for WWE, and what's best for WWE is making money. Jinder is going to make them money in India. They need a face in India 
to market there, and they picked him, and he's much better than the great Kali, no doubt about it, you know, but they wanted to give him a run with the championship. I don't see Jinder as a WWE champion just based on what I've seen from his past. It's very hard to grasp the fact that this guy was jobbing to everybody on Monday Night Raw and nothing but an enhancement talent, and now he goes to SmackDown and he's the WWE champion. Yeah, land of opportunity, great, but it's not going to make me believe him anymore now that he's the WWE champion. I still don't think he is on par with where he should be in the ring. Even though the match with Randy Orton wasn't that bad, it wasn't that bad. It felt like a main event. It looked like a main event. Most of it has to do with Randy Orton being there, but, you know, it was it was worthy of being a main event, you know? I just hope, I just hope, as far as Jinder Mahal goes, I hope the fans give him the proper heel heat. I don't want to see WWE shove Jinder down our throats because he's the, next, he's the new big thing now and they got to market him in India. I don't want to see Jinder get go-away heat. There's a difference between go-away heat and legit heat as a WWE champion, okay? If they're going to do these fucking, uh, you know, Indian celebrations on, on SmackDown Live, please, you spare me the trouble. You're going to make me not want to see him anymore. That was awful, okay? But if you're legit going to continue building up his character and giving him, uh, you know, giving him himself character and get over that anti-American, you don't like me of who, uh, because of who I am and how rich I am and how I look and how I sound and how I speak four, four or five different languages, whatever the case may be, continue building that up because that's an easy sell. People are going to legit give him the right type of heat because that is a heat magnet. You know, the whole USA thing and the outsider and the foreign fanatic and all that shit, that's legit heat. I don't mind that. You know, people are like, oh, here we go again with the typical bullshit, the anti-American garbage. But it works. It works. I'd rather them do that and be safe so he gets legit heat instead of just coming out on television and people giving him go-away heat as to the point where they don't want to see him on fucking television. Okay? Now he's the WWE champion. Market him as a WWE champion. Get him merchandise. Make him a big deal. Get him some new fucking theme music. You know, give him some identity. Now he's the WWE champion, okay? It's it's a tougher thing for them to maintain him at that at that spot than it was to build him up. Now he's there, so prove to me that this guy's WWE championship material, because you didn't do it before. Now you made him the champion for business reasons. At least show me, convince me that he's WWE championship material. But was it too soon? Absolutely. Was it going to be more than four weeks? Absolutely. Do I mind him being the WWE champion? No. Because this is just an interim thing. This is... I wouldn't say he's a transitional champion. I would say he's a test subject right now. Transitional champion, they last two or three weeks, and then, you know, it's just something that they do, and then it goes right back to the, the guy who, who lost it or somebody else that they got lined up. Jinder's not a transitional champion. If he's holding the title till September, he's not a transitional champion. Because that's a good eight weeks. Before SummerSlam, okay? We got, what, it's June, July? So that, that's well, 10 weeks, 11 weeks before we get to SummerSlam. So that's not a transitional champion. But now he's the champion. Now you got your work cut out for you. You got to make me believe he's a champion. We're going to get the rematch with Randy Orton at Money in the Bank. Fine. I don't see Jinder losing there either. You know, not especially if they're going to India and going to be touring India. You know, they're touring India later this summer, which I, I read. So why would they take the title of Jinder before they go tour to India? It doesn't make sense. Jinder's going to be champion. You're going to have to live with it. This is a business decision. You run a business to make money. WWE is here not to please anybody. They're here to please their wallets. That's something that you guys have to understand. See, I understand that. I, don't, I never doubt WWE's business. I always doubt their booking. I always doubt their creative uh, mind with storylines and characters and the shit that they do. This, to me, doesn't bother me. The fact that, yeah, he, he was only built up in four weeks and they gave him a WWE championship, yeah, that bothers me, you know? If they knew, they knew they were touring India well before 
Jinder even went to SmackDown. If they wanted something like that, he should have been on SmackDown Live and been built up months prior. The fact that they did it in four weeks and then gave him the WWE Championship is a little questionable to me. You know? But do I mind him being WWE Champion? No, I don't. Anything is better than babyface Randy Orton. It's just the way that they did it really doesn't sit well with me. But Backlash has officially come and gone. Jinder is the new WWE Champion, and the wrestling world is still in shock over what happened. Everybody's talking about it. The entire pay-per-view was mediocre, according to these people. I liked it, with plenty of highs and lows throughout. So what about the ticket sales for Backlash? It was in Chicago. You figure Chicago's a wrestling town. Nakamura's there. Owens versus Styles. Good show, right? Good show. According to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio, Backlash did not sell out. This was especially surprising since Chicago is usually one of the hottest markets for WWE. Meltzer says that the ticket sales started off hot and stalled significantly after matches were announced for the event. He also mentions that WWE priced their tickets fairly high for the event, so that played into it as well. The pay-per-view likely still had a solid gate amount, even without sell selling out completely. We can assume that this drop in ticket sales have to do with the main event of Jinder Mahal versus Randy Orton. Melton notes that WWE is going all in on their expansion into India, and only time will tell if this pays off. The WWE only makes money off their television deal in India right now. Putting the title on Jinder is likely a play to make more money from the country in things like merchandise sales and network subscribers. And if that is the case... Jinder ain't losing the title anytime soon, and he will be taking that title to India as they market, especially for network subscribers. As a result, it is a weird time where WWE might be willing to take the short-term hit in viewership and ticket sales in the United States if it means long-term success in India. You know, people were turned off at the gate for ticket sales. You know, people, to me, the, the high price ticket... For, for backlash, you know that that really doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, if, if the people in, if the people enjoyed or or deemed something main event worthy, they would pay. You know, that, that that's a hotbed for WWE of Chicago. I mean, if you put on a main event that fans will love and they know will love, they'll buy the tickets no matter how expensive they are. But it all goes back to what I said. You know, this is not just me saying it. This is a universal feeling. You can't get behind Jinder Mahal in four weeks as a credible threat and someone to take the WWE Championship. That was the same sentiment that I'm sure these people felt and the reason why they didn't buy tickets because they were not emotionally invested in what Jinder Mahal and what WWE was portraying with Jinder Mahal. Simple. It's not just me saying it. The people are saying it and they're speaking with their wallets. It's not rocket science. If you don't build up somebody properly to the fans and don't get him to a point where they are emotionally invested to spend their money, it's not going to work. And it was rushed. WWE knew they were touring India. If this is something that they had in mind, why did it come off so rushed? Why did they only got four weeks to do it? And why didn't they put Jinder on SmackDown months prior and at least build him up as a credible threat to take down Randy Orton? Or at least build him up as a title contender and then go after Randy Orton? They had to know what their schedule was, you know, in the coming months. I don't know why this was just done in four weeks. We blinked. Jinder was there. He was number one contender. He got a title shot and he won the title. But you want me to accept that after this guy was fucking 3MB trash and after he jobbed to fucking Roman Reigns and everybody under the fucking moon on Monday Night Raw. Really? Come on, man. Not logical. Doesn't make sense. But gender's WWE champion. Do I mind? No. I just don't like the way WWE went about it. But we're going to have to stick with him. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stick. Jinder Mahal is your WWE champion. Kurt Angle returning to the ring. Rumors of him coming back to the WWE in a wrestling capacity. Some small news on this. Kurt Angle has been on the job as Monday Night Raw general manager for about a month and a half now. It's been great seeing Kurt back on WWE television on a weekly basis, but many fans still want to see him wrestle another match for the company. 
Angle himself has been very vocal about wanting to wrestle for WWE and is very confident that it will happen one day. The latest on this situation several weeks ago was that Angle will be undergoing a physical to determine if WWE will clear him to compete. It is unclear when this physical will take place, but that will be the key to his return. According to some rumors flowing around, if Angle was to wrestle again for WWE, it will be at WrestleMania 34. If true, this makes a lot of sense because WWE would want to save the return of Angle to the ring for a big moment. If it is announced several months from now that Angle will be making his in-ring return at WrestleMania 34, interest for the event will be driven up immensely. Everything is depending on the physical for Kurt. Based on some of his interviews recently, it seems he thinks he will be able to pass. Good. You could put him against Brock Lesnar in a rematch that I am very interested in seeing. Done. Take the title off Lesnar, give it to Reigns, build Reigns up against somebody else, and put Lesnar and Kurt Angle in the ring at WrestleMania. I'm done. That's all I'm going to say on that. Because I ain't no way excited for Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 34. Fuck that noise. But Angle, he'll be back in WWE in a wrestling capacity, and it will be at WrestleMania 34. I am certain on that. WWE does not want to get involved in the broken gimmick saga. This is bad. I don't know what's going on. But things are getting ugly between Impact Wrestling and the Hardys surrounding the broken gimmick. On Tuesday night, Impact Wrestling's president, Ed Nordholm, released several documents, including part of Matt Hardy's contract. It is clear that the two sides will likely have to settle things in court if we ever want to see the gimmick in WWE. But why hasn't WWE gotten involved and helped out the Hardys? According to the latest Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer says that WWE doesn't want to set the precedent of buying a gimmick idea from someone else. It was also noted that WWE has interest in the gimmick um, or they wouldn't allow Matt to do any of his broken gimmick mannerisms on television. As noted prior, Nordholm is claiming that WWE has no interest at all in using the gimmick. Ed Nordholm is a fucking liar. I'll tell you that. You know, I don't give a shit what emails were released or what emails he showed. WWE is, of course, interested in the broken gimmick, if only for monetary reason they are interested in it. Even though WWE is interested, they are likely not going to get involved anytime soon. It seems like the use of the gimmick in WWE all depends on if Matt can win the battle against Impact by himself. It seems like Matt is confident. He tweeted out on May 23rd, 2017, around 10.30 p.m. that evening, I tell the truth and I don't need to desperately overcompensate to prove my public credibility. My facts will be shared via the correct venue. We'll have to see how it all turns out. Until then, Matt will not be broken in the WWE anytime soon. Now, a follow-up on this. Uh, the broken Matt Hardy trademark has been refused by uh, the United States Patent uh, Copyright Agency. And th this is this is really uh, it's, it's a huge step back for Matt Hardy, man. I, I'm, I'm very shocked over this. You know, um, a lot has changed since Tuesday. And with everything that Ed Nornholm has said, you know, he, he upped the ante early this week by releasing Matt Hardy's Impact Wrestling contract. It appears that the Hardys' fight to bring the broken universe to WWE has hit another roadblock. According to PW Insider now, Matt's trademark application for the broken gimmick was initially refused by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office with agency's refusal reading as follows. And I quote, Registration is refused because the applied for mark as used on the specimen of record identifies only the name of a particular character, personal name. It does not function as a service mark to identify and distinguish applicant service from those of others and to indicate the source of applicant's service. Whatever the fuck that means, it sounds like complete gibberish to me. Holy shit. In a more simpler term, the United States Patent Office seems to have refused the broken Matt Hardy trademark application and does not sufficiently establish Matt's gimmick as being distinct from other professional wrestling personas. As the refusal was released this past week, Hardy has six months from Thursday, May 25th, to respond before the trademark application is officially abandoned. As WWE fans continue to witness on Monday Night Raw, there are only brief moments where Matt dips in and out of the broken Matt Hardy gimmick and shows at least some of that broken brilliance. 
he showcased last year on Impact, back when it was still known in TNA. Apparently, Matt has no choice, even though WWE was clearly begging to see more uh, than just brief teases, as evidenced by their frequent delete chants and hand gestures. Now, if WWE chooses not to directly involve itself in the ongoing legal uh, bindings, that is, uh, Impact Wrestling, and even with Matt Hardy's Impact contract stating that the company does have a right to his gimmick, it wouldn't be surprising if Matt decides to take matters into his own hands and buy the gimmick himself. That can be inferred from text messages released by Impact's Ed Norholm, which included one where Matt said he was open to receiving an offer for the intellectual property of the Broken Brilliance gimmick. The publication also quoted the Wrestling Observer's Dave Meltzer, who stated that WWE's hands-off approach doesn't necessarily mean that the company isn't interested in the Broken Matt Hardy gimmick or any other Broken Universe gimmicks. And I quote from Meltzer, if WWE had no interest in the Broken Universe, Matt would be told, you will not be doing this stuff on Monday Night Raw. As of now, he said um, that this, between the Hardys and Impact Wrestling, um, will continue... Uh, but since the Broken Matt Hardy trademark application was only initially refused, there is still a lot of time for Matt to respond and restate his case in hopes of getting his popular gimmick trademarked once and for all. I don't know, man. Um, I don't I don't really know where to go from here as far as an opinion goes. This, this is completely fucking childish. You know, TNA, you know, TNA, we know Impact is not going to use that gimmick for anything. They're not going to use it for anything. What are they going to use it for? You know, it's going to be stored away. It's not like they sell merchandise. It's not like they fucking have a, uh, a fucking sea of DVDs going out. You know, they might want to market the, the final deletion. They might want to sell it on DVD. You know, they might want to fucking do something with their YouTube channel. But, you know, who gives a shit? Yeah, who, watches, who watches Impact? You know? I get more people... Watching my channel monthly than Impact does monthly. I got 1.4 million people watching my channel on a monthly basis. Impact can't even break 200,000 views on Pop TV. Seriously. You know? I, I'm telling you, if I went to Impact as a personality, most of you would watch Impact for me. Which in turn would make them more popular. But I wouldn't go to Impact because they're garbage. Seriously, I would not accept a job offer from Impact Wrestling. And to the fucking asshole or assholes who want to make videos about JD from NY being hypocritical as you get one view on your TNA Impact review, right? Because nobody fucking cares about Cowboy James Storm and Bobby Lashley, who's got to be the most fucking cringeworthy champion since Randy Orton babyface Randy Orton. Give me a break. I don't know which is worse, you know? But regardless of all that, I would not take a job offer from TNA. I would not, just based on how they do business, okay? Who knows? If they're doing this to Matt Hardy, out of spite to fuck everybody, including him and the fans, what would they do to the, another talent that wants to go, go to WWE or wants to fucking get out of their contract and doesn't want to be there anymore, you know? These are... You know, these are vicious businessmen. These are vicious suits that don't give a fuck about anything, man. This is when this is what happens when you have a a company that does not give a fuck about wrestling, owning a wrestling company. They don't give a fuck about the fans. If they did, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be arguing over a fucking gimmick that will do nothing for them going on into the future. Nothing. I don't understand it. Let the fans enjoy the gimmick for what it is. You fucked them over. You didn't get them a contract in time. You slighted them. And they said, fuck you. I don't want to sign with you guys. We're taking our business elsewhere. And that's exactly what they did. If you had any care for the Hardys, you would have offered these guys contracts, legal contracts, signed, sealed, and delivered six months before their deal was coming up. If you really valued the Hardys, you would have done everything in your power to keep them instead of giving them a contract two days before their fucking impact contracts come to a close. That's how, that's how you treat talent, especially talent that's pretty much put your company on the map for 2016 after all the bullshit that you put Billy Corgan through. 
Seriously, making a fucking terrible name for yourself? Seriously, who's going to want to come to Impact? Nobody. Impact is garbage. Seriously, it is garbage. When your main storyline is Jeremy Borash and fucking Josh Matthews, hand me a fucking noose and please strangle me. Awful. If you had any care about what the Hardys did for your company in 2016, you would have treated them as such. Clearly, you thought you were better. You got all these new people to come in. You're going to revert back to the old ways, the old-fashioned ways. We don't have any time for fucking, you know, delete or, you know, defending our tag team titles in space and time and all this other bullshit that you wanted to throw shade at the Hardys for, you know, after they fucking put you on the map and did massive numbers with their gimmick and their final deletion and all this shit. It might, be, it might not be everybody's cup of coffee, but it worked. It worked. And people love it. And now you're fucking everybody else over, and them, and the fans, who want to see the gimmick continue in WWE. For what? Unless you're going to give this gimmick to somebody, which will never be the same, and you'll, be, and you'll look fucking pathetic for it, you know? Let them have it. If you want something in return, Matt said he would be willing to buy the gimmick. Take the money and shut your fucking mouth. Instead of being the schoolyard bully here, and being one of these fucking... You know, annoying fucks in the schoolyard who thinks he's big, rough, and tough. This is mine, and you can't have it, you know? Whatever. So fucking stupid. But I, I hope this is really ended soon. You know, the gimmick uh, is desperately needed for the Hardys in WWE. Um, I love the Hardys, I really do, but you, you can tell that this whole thing since their return is wearing off very, very quickly. Uh, they need it. Uh, Jeff is okay on his own. Jeff will be fine, but Matt, Matt, Matt needs it. Matt looks like he's in, in, in fucking limbo. He doesn't know what the fuck he wants to do. Whatever the case may be, um, the, the Hardys will run their course. The nostalgia will wear thin. It will wear away, uh, and, I, and I hope it's not too late. I hope we get the gimmick before that happens, but I, I wish them the best in this shit, man. I really do. But uh, listen, if, if Matt wants to try and buy the gimmick, if, if, if all else fails in court, you know, Hopefully, something comes out of this where he can buy the gimmick and, and, and utilize it in WWE. I don't know. I'll keep you guys updated on it, but uh, right now, uh, a big step back with the United States Patent Office as far as Broken Matt Hardy and copywriting that gimmick uh, goes. A few steps back for Broken Matt Hardy. We got news here on Sasha Banks. Plans for Sasha Banks at Extreme Rules, as if anybody fucking cares. She's been uh, in a feud with Alicia Fox. Uh, as if, uh, you know, that really is, uh, you know, fucking tearing the world on fire on Monday Night Raw. Sasha Banks has recently been uh, has been removed from the Raw Women's Championship picture. Over the past few weeks on Monday Night Raw, she's been involved in a feud with Alicia Fox, and the two have been trading victories. Sasha was able to pick up the victory this past week, but it was Fox who was able to get the upper hand alongside her boyfriend, Noam Dar. So what's next for Sasha Banks? According to Dave Meltzer on Wrestling with Reverend Radio, Sasha at Extreme Rules could be involved in a mixed tag team match. WWE teased it this week on Raw with Sasha uh, pushing Noam Dar. So who will Sasha's partner be? It will likely be Cedric Alexander, who returned to 205 Live this week from injury. Alexander has a history with both Fox and Dar from before his injury, and he could make sense in this spot. Bailey and Alexa Bliss have already been announced for the Roman Championship match um, at Extreme Rules uh, with a kendo stick on a pole match. Ooh, I can't fucking wait. It's possible that Sasha rejoins the women's title picture after this short feud, but we will have to wait and see. I am not sure on that. I read another report where Vince McMahon is still down on Sasha Banks because he doesn't like her style in the ring, and he thinks she's incredibly risky and injury prone. So be it. Rather have Sasha... Then fucking Carmella and Alicia Fox and Naomi and, and, well, actually, I like Naomi. I got to take that back. Tamina and whatever the fuck else they got going on, you know? Dana Brooke. How often can you do Sasha and, uh, or, or Bailey and Alexa? That's going to wear thin too, you know? And the thing that I want is a heel Sasha. Utilize her in a role that is going to be beneficial for her. After this bullshit with Alicia Fox, start programming Sasha and Bailey. Have Bailey win the title back or whatever. 
Or even I'd like to see a, a feud between Sasha and Alexa. I think that would be good. Something different, something fresh, you know? But I'm hoping for a... I'm, I'm still hoping for a babyface... A babyface Bailey chasing a heel Sasha. That's what I would want. Seriously. I would have I would have Sasha take the title from Alexa and not Bailey before SummerSlam sometime in the next couple of weeks. And you build Sasha as a heel and Bailey chasing a heel Sasha towards SummerSlam where she would win the title back. That's what I would do. Sasha's gotta be a heel. Right now she has lost so much momentum. Don't know what they can do to get it back, but turning her heel would certainly help that cause. No question. Long-term plans for the Universal Championship and Brock Lesnar. This is a lot here. Let's talk about this. Brock Lesnar is currently the WWE Universal Champion. It is looking like we won't see him until Great Balls of Fire. God. Can't wait to hear Michael Cole say that fucking 38 times on Monday Night Raw. My balls will be on fire. That will mark three months since winning the title at WrestleMania 33 against Goldberg. Dave Meltzer on the Wrestling Observer Radio this week speculated about the long-term plans for the Universal Championship. And if you don't want to hear any spoilers, which I'm sure you guys don't really give a shit about because you come here for the fucking news anyway. If you don't want to hear spoilers, then please turn the video off right now. I'll give you guys three seconds. One, two, three. Brock's first opponent, obviously, will be the winner of the Extreme Rules Fatal Five Way between Bray Wyatt, Finn Balor, Samoa Joe, Roman Reigns, and Seth Rollins. You guys know where I stand on that. I'm not repeating myself. Roman Reigns is the only one that makes sense to me. Okay? Because Bray Wyatt, you ain't beating Brock Lesnar. Don't give a fuck how scary you sound or how fucking cryptic you are. You know, the face of fear, the boogeyman, in the darkness with your fucking lantern. I don't give a fuck. Okay, you can sound apocalyptic all you want. You ain't beating Brock Lesnar, motherfucker. Nothing that that man says to me will ever make me believe he can beat Brock Lesnar. So Bray Wyatt's out of the picture. Finn Balor, I don't want it. Looks like WWE's going that direction. There's nothing in Finn Balor's arsenal that's going to make me believe he will stand a chance against Brock Lesnar. It's going to be like a fucking... Uh, a, 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 a hungry mountain lion being annoyed by some fucking gnat flying around him. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be when Brock Lesnar feasts at the dinner table. He takes a fucking toothpick, wipes his fucking teeth clean with the toothpick, and then breaks it in half. That's going to be Finn Balor. Do I see that happening? Fuck no. Samoa Joe? I've been wanting it for months. Might as well do it. If you want to do it, do it now. Because there's no, there's no more legit match in WWE besides a Braun Strowman than Samoa Joe. And as a SummerSlam main event, I pay a lot of money to see Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar. That's just me. But I'm sure the majority of you guys as well would pay to see that as well. Seth Rollins? I would give it to Seth Rollins just based on how great he's been in the ring lately. So I could see that. And I don't mind that. And I think Rollins and Lesnar would actually have a very good match. Roman Reigns? The inevitability will be coming, no doubt about it. You don't want to wait till WrestleMania. How many fucking WrestleMania moments does this guy need? You know? People don't even get one. This guy's going to have four in a row. Give me a break. Give me the inevitability. Give him the championship at SummerSlam and build someone else up for Roman Reigns at WrestleMania and have Brock Lesnar go on to fight Kurt Angle at WrestleMania because I would much rather see Angle versus Lesnar than Reigns versus Lesnar. Don't know about you guys, but... Reigns and Lesnar does absolutely jack shit to me at WrestleMania. Don't want to see it. Now, being that that's all out of the way, Meltzer suggests that the winner of the match will likely either be Finn or Seth. One of them will go on to face Brock at Great Balls of Fire. Now, I don't know whether Bray is still feuding with Finn. If Finn doesn't win, I'm assuming Bray will get Finn at Great Balls of Fire, and then maybe we see some type of triple threat match at SummerSlam between Rollins, Lesnar, and Finn. I don't know. I could see WWE going that route. But they did tease a Bray Wyatt-Finn Balor match. I mean, he did attack him in that triple threat match. Number one contendership for the Intercontinental Championship, unless I'm supposed to forget that ever fucking happened. You know? So, I don't know. As of right now, if it's not Reigns, which to me, he makes the most sense, if WWE's not going to go with Reigns right now, if he's out of the picture, I'm going with Rollins. I don't think Finn's going to win this thing. 
I don't think Finn and Brock Lesnar one-on-one -on -one is a good match. Some people might not think Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar one-on-one -on is a good match, but I'd rather have Rollins than Balor against Lesnar. If you're going to include Balor in any type of match with Brock Lesnar, it's going to be in a triple threat capacity. It's going to be Rollins, Lesnar, and Balor. That's it. That's the way I do it. I would not have Balor and Lesnar one-on-one. -on -one. Now, following this, Brock will defend the title at SummerSlam. This will likely be a returning Braun Strowman. I wouldn't even do that then. I would not even do that then. Strowman was originally rumored to face Brock at Great Balls of Fire, but was recently sidelined with an elbow injury. This forced WWE to change plans. Strowman is expected to return much sooner than the six months that WWE is telling us. If they do want to go ahead with Braun Strowman and Brock Lesnar, I would have Strowman beat Brock Lesnar. I would have him win the Universal Championship because there is no better statistic on your resume than beating Brock Lesnar. Not only beating Brock Lesnar, but beating him for the Universal Championship at your second biggest pay-per-view of the year. Plus, you get the title on a full-time guy, which will be presented on Monday Night Raw each and every week instead of three months without the title on Raw with Brock Lesnar. Simple. Lesnar does not need to be the Universal Champion. You gave him the title... To get the feud with Goldberg over, okay? That wasn't the only reason you gave him the title. You gave him the title because Lesnar is who he is. You know, whoever is going to beat Brock Lesnar is going to be a made man. So, you might as well do that now. If it's not going to be Reigns, you might as well do it with Strowman. Because there's nobody more believable on the roster in a match with Brock Lesnar than Samoa Joe and Braun Strowman. And if you're not going to do Joe, you might as well do it with Strowman. Strowman's your money man. Strowman's the guy you've been building up. So you might as well give Strowman the overall huge statistic on his resume. Have him beat Brock Lesnar. Have him hold the title until you get to Roman Reigns. Because obviously there's shit that needs to be tied up with those two as well. So it all makes sense. It all makes sense. All I know is Lesnar needs to have that title removed from him, and put back on somebody who was full-time. That's just my honest opinion on that. Brock is expected to wrestle again before WrestleMania 34, maybe even more than once. This is where we could see Rollins, Balor, whoever loses at Extreme Rules, Bray Wyatt, or Samoa Joe as potential opponents. So Meltzer is claiming that everybody in this Fatal 5-Way match will have at least a shot one-on-one -on -one with Brock Lesnar before WrestleMania 34. Lastly, if all goes according to plan, Brock will defend the title at WrestleMania 34 against Roman Reigns. Fucking pass me the bleach. And put a nice little fucking wedge of lime on that glass, please. I want it to go down easy. Meltzer reported that this was the plan several months ago. We can assume Reigns would be winning the title in that spot. Make it a double. Obviously, things can change, but this is all speculation right now on what WWE wants for the Universal Championship title picture, and it could look different over the next several months. Take this all with a grain of salt, obviously coming from Dave Meltzer. So, you guys know how I feel about all this. Please, am I, am I, am I sounding crazy, or do I make sense here? A am I making sense here? I, I think I am. I think I am. Take the title off Lesnar, give it to Strowman. I don't want to see Roman versus Lesnar at WrestleMania. I don't. I don't. Please, I'd rather sit, I'd rather sit facing this door, fucking, uh, just looking at the fucking paint dry on this door than watch Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns against WrestleMania 34. Don't want to see it. Don't want to see it. Just give it to Strowman and do what you originally had planned. Strowman's your big, your, your big man, the monster among men, he's the guy you're building up, right? Give it to him. But again... Right now, to me, it makes more sense for Roman to do it. Roman took out Strowman. Roman injured Strowman. Roman should be quintessentially the number one guy. Give him the fucking title. You know, end our misery early. The inevitability is there. You know? Just do it. End the fucking torture. WWE won't do that. They want to give Roman another fucking WrestleMania moment. Four, four in a row. You know? People, people don't even break into the business and get a WrestleMania match. This guy's got four WrestleMania moments. Crowning moments. As if uh, WrestleMania 32 wasn't enough. You gotta have him do it at WrestleMania 34 as well. Give me a fucking break. Oh, but, oh, but JD, that was for the WWE title, man. This is for the Universal title, man. Who cares? Still the main event? Look at the fuck if the fu a box of crayons was on the line. Give me a break, man. Fucking pathetic. You always gotta make an excuse 
for this fucking clown, Roman Reigns. Give me a fucking break. Go wash your hair, you fucking asshole. Anyway, moving on. Speaking of the Fatal Five Way, one of the participants, uh, reason why Paul Heyman confronted Mr. Finn Balor on Monday Night Raw. On this week's episode of Raw, there was a segment between Finn Balor and a returning Paul Heyman. Heyman came to the ring and had a big praise for Finn Balor. This includes calling him the most talented in-ring performer in WWE today. I would not go that far, Mr. Paul Heyman, but to each his own. How come WWE chose to single out Finn Balor on Monday Night Raw? Well, Balor will face Bray Wyatt, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Samoa Joe at Extreme Rules. The winner earns a Universal Championship title match against Brock Lesnar. Once again, Dave Meltzer is reporting on Wrestling Observer Radio that the segment was interesting based on how much Heyman built up and put over Finn Balor. Heyman's comments and singling out Balor makes him look like the heavy favorite to walk away from Extreme Rules as the winner. Now, normally, when WWE does something like that and they make someone the heavy favorite, that means they are not the heavy favorite and they're probably not going to win. So I'm going with Seth Rollins. I want Roman Reigns just for that inevitability factor, but I'm going with Seth Rollins here. Seth Rollins is my choice to win this match. Now, Meltzer says that the segment told him that there will be a Balor vs. Lesnar match in the future. If he doesn't win at Extreme Rules, he is still expected to be an opponent for Lesnar before 2017 is over. The segment was used to tease that future match. WWE was clearly laying the foundation for a future match between the Beast incarnate, uh, incarnate and the Demon King. The only question now is when it will happen. Now, this might also be WWE's way to push the believability factor between a potential Balor and Lesnar match. Many fans have been critical that there's no way that Balor could ever defeat someone like Lesnar and the size of Lesnar. Maybe they are slowly going to build up Balor as a credible threat. Who the fuck knows? Balor can do nothing to be a credible threat to Brock Lesnar. Seriously. You you, you have to transform your... In, you, you have to walk into a fucking, uh, you know, a, a, a cryogenic fucking chamber. You gotta inject yourself with the fucking T-virus here. And you gotta turn into one of them fucking, uh, those, those beasts. You ever watch Resident Evil 1? Those shitty fucking Resident Evil movies? You know, where, where those, uh, those liquors... You know, those are the big thing towards the end of the movie. He eats that guy that's fucking trying to take the, the, the fucking briefcase with, with the T-virus in it. He gets fucking mauled by the liquor, right? The liquor kills that guy and he transforms into this fucking beast, right? He gets a new layer of fucking muscle and skin. That's what, that's what Finn Balor needs to do. Seriously, that's what Finn Balor needs to do. If you're not fucking, uh, you know, injected with the T-virus and you're fucking building cells and muscles and you're turning into some fucking weird creature, you ain't fighting Brock Lesnar one-on-one, bro. Sorry. No face paint is gonna make me believe that Finn Balor can take down Brock Lesnar. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, WWE can claim, uh, oh, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to make it believable, the Beast Incarnate versus the Demon. Is he really a demon? Is he gonna be shooting fire? Is he going to be flying around the ring, right? Is he going to be, is he going to grow claws that can actually, you know, scratch and put a mark on Brock Lesnar? Because other than that, you ain't doing nothing to Brock Lesnar, man. Like I said, toothpick. Whatever. The fuck do I know? I just don't want to see it. There's nothing believable in anything Finn Balor does offensively that's going to make me believe he can beat Brock Lesnar. Not happening. Money in the Bank. Let's talk about Money in the Bank here. Plans for the SmackDown Women's Division at Money in the Bank. It was reported this week by Pro Wrestling Sheet that a Women's Money in the Bank ladder match was likely for this year. Mr. Ryan Satin reported that on Pro Wrestling Sheet. Many fans have questioned what the hell is going on after SmackDown Live this week where there was no announcement for that match. It was announced that Charlotte Flair, Becky Lynch, Tamina, Carmella, and Natalya will face off next week in a, I guess, a fatal five-way that will earn themselves, or the winner will earn themselves, a SmackDown Women's title shot against Naomi at Money in the Bank. Now, according to this week's Observer Newsletter, WWE is planning two women's matches for Money in the Bank pay-per-view. First will be a SmackDown Women's title match. Naomi will defend against whoever the winner is on SmackDown Live next week. I, I'm assuming it's going to be Charlotte. The Observer confirms that a Women's Money in the Bank match is the plan right now for the remaining women. Unless things change, this means there will be two Big women's matches on the card at the event this year. WWE apparently had plans for a women's Money in the Bank ladder match last year. These plans were eventually scrapped. Let's hope WWE doesn't do the same thing again this year. 
As for the competitors, it is unclear exactly what WWE will do. SmackDown Live might have to bring in some more female talent for the ladder match if that happens. With Naomi defending her title, that would only leave four women for a potential ladder match, not including Lana. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens. I, you know, I don't see why... <sighs> you know, I understand why they want to defend the title. I really do. Um, I don't mind them having two matches. I don't mind them doing Naomi and Charlotte. Get that out of the way. Have that for the Women's Championship. But having a Money in the Bank ladder match with four women... The four remaining women, you got Becky, you got Naomi, you know, you got Becky, you got uh, Tamina, Natalia, and Carmella, right? Unless they bring in two NXT talents, don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they bring back Nikki, I don't know. Maybe they put Lana in there, I don't know. I don't think that would be uh, beneficial for her as, a, as her debut match, you know? But if they do a Money in the Bank with the four and they don't bring in anybody, I think Carmella is going to be one to take the Money in the Bank. I think Carmella would be the winner of the Money in the Bank briefcase. Call me crazy. I just have a feeling WWE would go with Carmella in winning the Money in the Bank. Princess of Staten Island, or whatever the wherever the fuck she's from, Long Island, Staten Island, all the same fucking islands to me. Who gives a shit, right? I, I see her winning the Money in the Bank briefcase. I could see fucking Ellsworthless being a lackey carrying that fucking thing around. I could see it right now. If that's the way they do it, uh, I could see Carmella winning that, but I would definitely like to see a, a women's Money in the Bank ladder match. I mean, it scares the shit out of me about those small, petite women there. You know, everybody but Tamina, you know, but, uh, you know, Becky flying off a ladder, taking a ladder shot. I don't know how that's going to go over, man. Another first for WWE. I'm interested in seeing it, but I'm also having reservations about what could turn out to be a long evening for all the women involved there. But Wrestling Observer is, sta is stating it that Naomi and looks like Charlotte going to be the championship match just by itself one-on-one. -on -one, and then we're going to get another women's match, hopefully being a ladder match for the briefcase. Uh, our first ever women's Money in the Bank ladder match. So it's interesting, man. We'll have to see what happens. Or, or, or maybe or maybe they don't do anything. Maybe they don't have the title being defended and they, they put all five of those women in the, in the ladder match that night. I don't know. And maybe they cash it in that night. Who the fuck knows? So that Naomi has a match. I don't know. I'm just coming up with ideas. But I, I think the, the, the beneficial way to do it here is Charlotte Naomi. Give us a, a women's championship match so Naomi can defend the title and lose it. And then have a, a women's Money in the Bank match and crown a first ever women's Money in the Bank briefcase holder. I say Carmella, man. I'm going with Carmella if it does indeed happen at Money in the Bank. Speaking of pay-per-views, Extreme Rules, the next pay-per-view for Monday Night Raw, uh, we'll see a steel cage match. Why a steel cage match for the Raw Tag Team Championships instead of it being a ladder match? This is fucking retarded. WWE thinks this is a proper reason to not have a tag team ladder match for the Tag Team Championships. Listen to this fucking stupidity. Matt Hardy was able to defeat Sheamus this past week on Monday Night Raw. As a result, he was able to pick the stipulation for the Raw Tag Team Championships. The Hardy Boys will defend their titles at Extreme Rules against Sheamus and Cesaro. Matt announced that he was choosing a steel cage match. This confused many fans. Why wouldn't the Hardys choose a ladder match or a TLC match or something that is them, you know? Meltzer on the Wrestling Observer Radio Show briefly mentioned that the reason they went with a steel cage match is because of the high amount of ladder matches recently. Oh, who doesn't like a ladder match? Are you going to complain that there's too many ladder matches? Am I going to complain that there's too many ladder matches? Ladder matches is one of my favorite matches that WWE does. Yes, I don't like to see an over, overabundance of them, but I haven't given any, any indication. You guys haven't given any, any indication. The fans haven't given any indication that we're tired of ladder matches, right? There's an overabundance of ladder matches lately. NXT TakeOver Chicago saw a DIY face-off against the Authors of Pain in a ladder match. Also, the Hardy Boys made their triumphant return in a, in a ladder match at WrestleMania 33. Plus, Money in the Bank takes place next month. The idea is to change things up a little bit, and that is why the Steel Cage match was booked instead. Regardless of the, of, of the stipulation, it should be a fun match. Most fans know Jeff Hardy's history in Steel Cage matches, and we are likely to be in for a treat at Extreme Rules. Lame. I don't give a fuck, man. Yes, they came back in a ladder match. Whose fault is that? That's WWE. They wanted to make that into a ladder match. The week before WrestleMania. Didn't need to be. Didn't need to be at all. But they did it, right? 
And then DIY. DIY vs. Authors of Pain. Okay, that's NXT. That has nothing to do with the main roster. And then you got Money in the Bank, which is an every year thing. Who gives a shit? If it makes sense, do it. TLC match would have been perfect for the Tag Team Championships. But WWE's going with Extreme Rules. They're going with a Steel Cage match. Whatever the reason is, man, who gives a shit? WWE, again, uh, not making sense of anything, really. As far as what they do on television, man. And that is pretty much it, man. That's all I got. We're an hour in here. I'm going to end it there. I have more news and rumors coming up tomorrow for Off the Script. Part number two on Sunday. Things are a little bit backwards. There was no video on Friday. Saturday is going to be part one. Sunday is going to be part two. I'll probably do a part three on Monday. We'll see what's going on, if there's any more news. But uh, there really hasn't been any more news, man. You know, I, I covered a lot of stuff. And I backtracked, and I've been keeping up to date on a lot of things, man. Not, not a lot coming out of Backlash. Not a lot. You know, I might I might end up doing a Backlash review if you guys are still interested in hearing my thoughts on it. I gave you my main thoughts on Jinder Mahal. So I don't know why you would want a Backlash review. If you guys want it, I'll do it. If, the, if there's an audience for it, I'll do it. But regardless, I want to thank everybody for uh, stopping by the video today. Off the Script is back. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it sounded good. Hope it looked good. Hope you were entertained. And I will be back with part two tomorrow morning right here on the channel, man. If you guys are going to be in Queens, I'll be at House of Glory tonight. Make sure you guys stop by and say hello. If you uh, are interested in buying a beer, I will never turn you down. And I will see you guys tomorrow for part two of the number one podcast right here on YouTube.com. Also available on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Audio Boom, and Google Play Music. Please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes for free. You automatically get it downloaded right to your device. And if you guys want to support the channel and the podcast, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. We got barbershopwindow.com slash off the script for your t-shirts and audibletrial.com slash off the script for your 30 days free of Audible with one free audio book. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And if you guys want to send in your sub stories for next week, email me JD from NY206 at yahoo.com and hit that subscribe button down below with the bell for notifications so you guys know when I upload daily right here on the channel. I am JD. Hit that fucking thumbs up. Instead of hitting it, fucking demolish that thumbs up down below on this episode of Off The Script. And I'll see you guys right back here for part two of this weekend's show. I'm JD. Making a great Saturday. I'll see you guys later for House of Glory. And I'll see you all on Sunday morning.